they're taking care of things. So if we get the snow plow in here, all the better. Anyway, Katie and the big snow. And today we filmed at the Lolo Pass Visitor Center. Anyway, I thought it was appropriate that, re that we read another snow book. Snowflake Bentley by Jacqueline Briggs Martin with the illustrations by Mary Azarian. I learned so much about snowflakes from this one. So, Snowflake Bentley, another delightfully wordy book, so if it's okay with you, again, I'll read the story and then share the pictures. So, we start with Snowflake Bentley. Alrighty. In the days when farmers worked with ox and sled and cut the dark with lantern light, there lived a boy who loved snow more than anything else in the world. Puff, it's cold and my fingers do not want to grip the pages. Willie Bentley's happiest days were snowstorm days. He watched snowflakes fall on his mittens on the dried grass of Vermont farm fields, on the dark metal handle of the barn door. He said snow was as beautiful as butterflies or apple blossoms. So I'm going to show you the pictures and you'll notice off to the side is like there's another story, but it's facts. So. I think what will work is I'll show you the pictures and then I'll read you the little informational sheet part sheet thing. Yeah. Wilson Bentley was born February 9th, 1865 on a farm in Jericho, Vermont, between Lake Champlain and Mount Mansfield in the heart of the snow belt, where the annual snowfall is about 120 inches. Holy buckets, that's a lot of snow. We'll do the math when I go back inside. He could net butterflies and show them to his older brother, Charlie. He could pick apple blossoms and take them to his mother. But he could not share snowflakes because he could not save them. Here's our pictures. His old brother Charlie, his mom, and now the sidebar. Willie's mother was his teacher until he was 14 years old. He attended school for only a few years. She had a set of encyclopedias, Willie said. I read them all. When his mother gave him an old microscope, he used it to look at flowers, raindrops, and blades of grass. Best of all, he used it to look at snow. While other children built forts and pelted snowballs at roosting crows, Willie was catching single snowflakes. Day after stormy day, he studied the icy crystals. From his boyhood on, he studied all forms of moisture. He kept a record of the weather and did many experiments with raindrops. And I'm going to take a quick break because my fingers are freezing and I'm gonna warm them up by the fire. I'll be right back. And we have a roasty toasty fire today. In fact, it's so toasty, can you see what it's doing to the snow on the back side? of the fire pit. Yeah, I thought that was pretty cool too. Anyway, life is better with a campfire. I'm back. Their intricate pattern was even more beautiful than he had imagined. He expected to find whole flakes that were the same, that were copies of each other, but he never did. 
Willie decided he must find a way to save snowflakes so others could see their wonderful designs. For three winters, he tried drawing snow crystals. They always melted before he could finish. So here's the picture of young Mr. Bentley drawing, attempting to capture the snow crystals. And now the informational part. He learned that most crystals had six branches, though a few had three. For each snowflake, the six branches were alike. I found that snowflakes were masterpieces of design, he said. No one design was ever repeated. When a snowflake melted, just that much beauty was gone without leaving any record behind. Starting at age 15, he drew a hundred snow crystals each winter for three years. When he was 16, Willie read of a camera with its own microscope. If I had that camera, I could photograph snowflakes, he told his mother. Willie's mother knew he would not be happy until he could share what he had seen. Fussing with snow is just foolishness, his father said. Still, he loved his son. When Willie was 17, his parents spent their savings and bought the camera. The camera made images on large glass negatives. Its microscope could magnify a tiny crystal from 64 to 3,600 times its actual size. It was taller than a newborn calf and cost as much as his father's herd of 10 cows. Willie was sure it was the best of all cameras. Even so, his first pictures were failures, no better than shadows, yet he would not quit. Mistake by mistake, snowflake by snowflake, Willie worked through every storm. Winter ended, the snow melted, and he had no good pictures. He waited for another season of snow. One day, in the second winter, he tried a new experiment, and it worked. Willie had figured out how to photograph snowflakes. Now everyone can see the great beauty in a tiny crystal, he said. So here's the picture, and then we will read about the experiment. Willie's experiment. He used a very small lens opening which let only a little light reach the negative, but he kept the lens open for several seconds, up to a minute and a half. He learned, too, that he could make the snow crystals show up more clearly by using a sharp knife to cut away all the dark parts of the negative around the crystals. This etching meant extra hours of work for each photograph, but Willie didn't mind. But in those days, no one cared. Neighbors laughed at the idea of photographing snow. Snow in Vermont is as, snow in Vermont is as common as dirt, they said. We don't need pictures. Willie said the photographs would be his gift to the world. While other farmers sat by the fire or rode to town with horse and, horse and sleigh, Willie studied snowstorms. He stood at the shed door and held out a black tray to catch the flakes.
When he found only jumbled, broken crystals, he brushed the tray clean with a turkey feather and held it out again. He waited hours for just the right crystal and didn't notice the cold. If the shed were warm, the snow would melt. If he breathed on the black tray, the snow would melt. If he twitched a muscle as he held the snow crystal on the long wooden pick, the snowflake would break. He had to work fast or the snowflake would evaporate. Would evaporate before he could slide it into place and take its picture. Some winters he was able to some winters he was able to make only a few dozen good pictures. Some winters he made hundreds. He learned that each snowflake begins as a speck, much too tiny to be seen. Little bits, molecules, of water attached to the speck to form its branches. As the crystal grows, the branches come together and trap small quantities of air. Many things affect the way these crystal branches grow. A little more cold, a bit less wind, or a bit more moisture will mean different shaped branches. Willie said that was why, in all his pictures, he never found two snowflakes alike. The best snowstorm of his life occurred on Valentine's Day in 1928. He made over a hundred photographs during the two-day storm. He called the storm a gift from King Winter. See, I learned all kinds of stuff from this story. Willie so loved the beauty of nature, he took pictures in all seasons. In the summer, his nieces and nephews rubbed coat hangers with sticky pitch from spruce trees. Then Willie could use them to pick up spider webs jeweled with water drops and take their pictures. On fall nights, he would gently tie a grasshopper to a flower so he could find it in the morning and photograph the dew-covered insect. So this is... The time it must have taken to do that is amazing. Willie's nieces and nephews lived on one side of the farmhouse that Willie shared with his brother Charlie. Willie often played the piano as they sang and shared stories and games with them. But his snow crystal pictures were always his favorites. He gave copies away or sold them for a few cents. He made special pictures as gifts for birthdays. He held evening slideshows on the lawns of his friends. Children and adults sat on the grass and watched while Willie projected his slides on a sheet hung over a clothesline. Many colleges and universities bought lantern slide copies of his photographs and added to their collections each year. Artists and designers used the photographs to inspire their own work. He wrote about snow and published his pictures in magazines. He gave speeches about snow to faraway scholars and neighborhood sky watchers. You're doing a great work said a professor from Wisconsin. The little farmer came to be known as the world's expert on snow, the snowflake man. But he never grew rich. He spent every penny on his pictures. Willie said there were treasures in the snow. I can't afford to miss a single snowstorm, he told a friend. I never know when I will find some wonderful prize. Other scientists raised money so Willie could gather his best photographs in a book. When he was 66 years old, Willie's book, His Gift to the World, was published. Still, he was not ready to quit. So this 
So there's a picture of his book called Snow Crystals. Even today, those who want to learn about snow crystals even today, those who want to learn about snow crystals begin with Wilson Bentley's book, Snow Crystals. And I have a copy of it on the shelf at, back at the apartment. I will show you when we go back in and warm up our fingers. By 1926, he had spent $15,000 on his work and received $4,000 from the sale of photographs and slides. Less than a month after turning the first page on his book, Willie walked six miles home in a blizzard to make more pictures. He became ill with pneumonia after that walk and died two weeks later. A monument was built for Willie in the center of town. The girls and boys who had been his neighbors grew up and told their sons and daughters the story of the man who loved snow. Forty years after Wilson Bentley's death, children in his village worked to set up a museum in honor of the farmer scientist. And his book has taken the delicate snow crystals that once blew across Vermont, past mountains, over the earth. Neighbors and strangers have come to know of the icy wonders that land on their own mittens, thanks to Snowflake Bentley. The plaque on the monument says, Snowflake Bentley, Jericho's world-famous snowflake authority. For 50 years, Wilson A. Bentley, a simple farmer, developed his technique of microphotography to reveal to the world the grandeur and mystery of the snowflake, its universal hexagonal shape, and its infinite number of lovely designs. Turns out what I pronounced hexagonal is actually hexagonal. And then we have a picture of Mr. Bentley with the camera and microscope setup that enabled him to take such beautiful pictures. And these are some samples of those snowflakes. And then there's a, a quote from him. The average dairy farmer gets up at dawn because he has to go work in the cow yard. I get up at dawn too, but it is because I want to find some leaf hung with dew or a spider web which the dew has made into the most delicate ropes of pearls. I take my camera with me, get down on my knees in the wet grass, and photograph these exquisite bits of nature. Because I do this, I can show these lovely things to people who never would have seen them without my help. They will get their daily quart of milk all right. Only far other farmers will attend to that but I think I am giving them something which is just as important. W. A. Bentley. Just delightful. And I'm going to share his hometowns. There's a museum in his hometown. And if you go there, you can see pictures of uh, his snowflakes, and lots of other cool things that they have at their museum. So, anyway, Snowflake Bentley by Jacqueline Briggs Martin, illustrated by Mary Azarian. So, anyway, um, I think that we should go in and have some hot chocolate and maybe some hot buttered toast and warm up the fingers. Thank you for being with me today. You guys are such a good audience.